Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the moderators, the Society, for the privilege of, uh, of speaking this morning. And I've been given the task by the moderators to talk about magnetic sphincter augmentation as an alternative to fundification. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, the most important of which is I hold or have recently held a res restricted research grant from Torex Medical and Ethicon, manufacturers of the device, uh, which will try to keep this um, uh, unbiased as possible, and uh, hopefully you'll agree that I've, I've done that job. Today I'm going to spend uh, about 15 minutes sort of talking just about the indications for magnetic sphincter augmentation. I'm going to review the single arm outcomes that have been published to date, uh, particularly in the larger trials of, of at least 100 patient uh, series. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the post-operative problems because I think you need to talk about the good and the bad if we're going to talk about an alternative to fundification. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some of the comparative outcomes that have been published in the literature uh, comparing uh, magnetic sphincter augmentation to laparoscopicness and fundification because I think that gives you the full view. This device, as you know, was approved by the FDA in 2012 uh, as a novel device to, to uh, manage acid reflux disease. And at that time, it was uh, positioned and, and thought to be really for people in the gap, the therapy gap, those folks, the 40% who had incomplete responses to PPI therapy, and really wasn't, in, really wasn't supposed to sort of take on Nissen fundification as, a, as an alternative. It was supposed to fit in that gap. And when you look at the spectrum of reflux disease that goes from normal to Barrett's with hernias and strictures put in here, the whole idea for magnetic sphincter augmentation when it first came out was to fit in this category, patients who had NERD, healable esophagitis, small hernias that were less than three centimeters. And so this is where it was supposed to be positioned. And the hope was that if we treated the disease earlier that we would prevent progression of the disease going forward. And at the time when the uh, FDA began to look at approval for this, the indications for use were for patients who had uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease confirmed by pH monitoring. They had to be uh, chronic GERD symptoms and have uh, symptoms despite the fact that they had maximal medical therapy. And they had some cautions for use in the FDA manifest that said, look, we didn't study this in hernias over three centimeters. Barrett's, patients with Barrett's were not included. We, we had a caution against LA class C and D esophagitis. And major motility disorders were, were sort of cautioned against being used. There was a, a, an additional laundry list of, of precautions that sort of listed here that you can see, of which things like motility problems, cancer, all things made sense to surgeons that you really wouldn't want to use this in, in, in these particular patient groups. But somehow these restrictions or indications or these cautions became the indications for the device. Uh, and it was picked up by insurance companies and, and others that really you shouldn't put the thing in, you should use these criteria as, as it, per implantation. And so hernia is less than three, no visible Barrett's, A and B esophagitis, no major motility disorders, no prior gastric surgery, and a BMI under 35 were really sort of the criteria with which surgeons were encouraged to sort of think about this placement. And now insurance companies have picked up on this. These have become restrictions. I've had recent denials from insurance companies saying, well, your hernia is four centimeters, can't have it. You've got some visible Barrett's, can't have it. So insurance companies are starting to, to pick up on, on these particular sort of items. The story really begins here with publication of this uh, manu manuscript uh, that really led to FDA approval in the New England Journal. It was a 100 patient series collected in multiple institutions. Um, and you can see these are the outcomes there on the left under the pivotal trial that showed really a, an excellent GERD HQRL at uh, two post-operative Demeester scores after implantation of magnetic sphincter of about 13.5, normalization in about 60% of patients, a PPI utilization rate or resumption rate of 14%, explants were 6%, and moderate to severe dysphagia based on the GERD HQRL score was about 21%. And shortly after that, several large series came out, Dr. Bonavina's group, Dr. Riegler's group, Dr. Warren, who represented my group, Dr. Lipham's group, and Dr. Taganidis put together some large series. Uh, Dr. Bonavina's a single institution series showing very similar outcomes to the pivotal trial. Dr. Riegler's group, a multi-institutional European group showing very similar results, although a slightly higher PPI utilization rate. And then my own group of Dr. Lipham, Dr. Taganidis showing very similar results, excellent excellent quality of life, um, a, a small resumption in PPI use, a low explant rate, and some, and some minor dysphagia. 
Fast forward several years, this is the most recent trial that's published with objective evidence of reflux control. This is the post-approval study that was mandated by the FDA after approval that now encompasses 200 patients in about 11 institutions across the United States using those very similar indications for implantation. And, and these are the components of the Demeester score in this particular trial showing outstanding results with placement at one year with magnetic sphincter augmentation. And this has reported one of the highest normalization rates uh, in the literature with a, P, a percent time normalized of about 75% and the normalization of the Demeester score in 72% of patients. And so this is where we stand currently with single arm trials. There's been several safety analyses. John Lippum published one originally with the first 1,000 patients who had magnetic sphincter augmentation showing a low interoperative rate of uh, problem, a, a small readmission rate, dilations were about 5%, erosion risk was 0.1%, and device removal was about 3.5%. That was updated by C. Dan Smith with 3,000 patients showing a similar erosion risk and a similar device removal risk. And then again, looked at by Dr. Lippum's group with now 9,500 patients worldwide. But this group looks specifically at erosion at 0.3% in the literature. And that's one of the biggest concerns people have. In the 3,000 trial by C. Dan Smith, the reason, reported reasons for removal at the 2.7% rate were dysphagia being the most common reason for removal, and it all occurred really within the first year, followed by reflux disease and a smattering of other potential problems that patients experienced. If we look closer at the incidence of dysphagia, you can see on the left, uh, moderate to severe dysphagia in 169 MSA patients was about 14%. And that really is daily symptoms and, uh, and those who had severe affecting daily symptoms. And then in the, on the right slide there in the PAS trial, that difficulty swallowing was at one year about 8.7%. So we've gotten better at sort of this issue of dysphagia. And I'll show you some comparative data later. One of the things that concerns people both having the device implant is, well, what about new onset dysphagia? Well, in the PAS trial of 200, 82, 82 patients had no dysphagia at the preoperative appointment. 30 of them developed new onset dysphagia, but most of it was fairly mild. They noticed it, didn't bother them. The bothersome ones were very small, but a th about 30 of them had it. 13 of them required a dilation, symptomatic resolution in, in 10 out of the 13 with a simple dilation. And so what we've come to learn is that dysphagia generally is bimodal. It's uh, in the early postoperative period, it occurs at about post-op day 10 to 14. It's usually related to encapsulation, self-limiting, and we usually treat it with rehab with frequent oral intake to exercise the device. And if it's really refractory, you can use a short course of steroids. Rarely do we dilate people these days. And we really get into, after that, people who have persistent dysphagia, and often solid food, it generally responds to people slowing down in the reading because they tend to still eat fast. A small number of patients will require dilation. There is a protocol by Torex that says you should dilate up to 15 millimeters with a, through the scope balloon. I've typically gone 15, 16, and 17 when I've had to dilate. And Dr. Steve Demeester has a pending trial that we're waiting the results from, from a multi-institutional group looking at dilation of magnetic sphincter. And then recently, Bill Richards, uh, in one of his papers, had talked about capsulotomy, taking patients back. He took two patients back to the OR to free up the capsule around the sphincter and, and seemed to have good results, but very short-term follow-up. The bigger burning question is this, late onset dysphagia, which we think requires evaluation because either things may have migrated or the most dreaded complication, erosion, that you can see there on the right. The worldwide erosion risk out of 9,000 is 0.3% or 29 erosions seen currently in this most recent publication that was presented at DDW last year. And you can see that the time frame of erosion is somewhere in the first two to three years after implantation. Whoops. When you have an erosion, the technique for removal currently is an endoscopic partial removal with delayed laparoscopic completion. You can see in the x-ray on the right that we have removed most of the beads and we ended up leaving several behind that we retrieved later. An endoscopic approach has been accomplished in about nine cases and then there's a variety of other options that people have tried to remove the eroded device. 
I would be remiss in not telling you that Torex issued a nationwide recall last fall. Um, that recall affected these lot numbers. Uh, they were all, they've all been since taken off the shelf, but this is a patient, uh, one year post-magnetic sphincter augmentation, who presented at six months later with uh, reflux, and we got a chest x-ray. This is what the device looks like if it's been part of the recall. There's a gap in the device, as you can see there. Total, up to date, 19, 19 identified devices out of 9,000 that had been affected by the recall. All but three or four of them had been removed. And really what happened is, as you can see where the arrow points, that little strut comes dislodged from the magnet. And you can see there that's one of the devices that we've taken out. Um, most of them come out simply. Some people have gone on to uh, further reconstruction at the time. Um, but some patients have opted to have nothing done and, and uh, have been generally fine. Now, one of the things that's been occurring over the last few years is extension of the, uh, the in original indications now. People are looking at persistent esophagitis, there's work on Barrett's, and there's work on larger hiatal hernias, and I'll show you some of that single outcome data. This is John Lippum's group looking at hiatal hernias between three and seven centimeters, a small series of 53, all had excellent improvement in their outcomes. Um, and what people really want to know as well, what happened to the device herniate with the larger hernias? At 12 months, there was none. At 18 months, they had a 4.5% transmediastinal herniation rate, a small rate of dysphagia. This is the largest series of, of Lynx devices placed in larger hernias. This is uh, Trip Buckley and Reg Bell's data presented at uh, Sages a couple years ago, 200 patients. They had about 20% of patients with small to medium hernias, three to five, but they had some large hernias. Five to 10 centimeters were half of the group. The large parasophageals accomplished for about 30, a third of the group. They had to do extensive mobilization. Uh, they accepted two centimeters into abdominal esophagus. They used pledgets and bioabsorbable mesh, sorry, bioabsorbable mesh in about 83% of those patients. And while all the quality of life indicators were excellent, in short-term follow-up, they noted that they had about 8% uh, transmediastinal herniation. I will remind you that Dr. Oschlager's paper on large parasophageal hernias at the same time frame had an 8% risk of reherniation, and so we, we we generally await the five-year results from Dr. Bell and Buckley to see what their final uh, reherniation rate might be. Last year at Sages, Dr. Lippman's group presented on Barrett's esophagus, looking at uh, patients who had known Barrett's esophagus biopsied up front. And uh, you can see that in patients who had ultra-short Barrett's esophagus, less than one centimeter, they had a regression rate of about 83%. And the longer the Barrett segment got, the less likely you were to have regression. But still, at long segment Barrett's over three centimeters, they had a regression rate of 25%, which was fairly good. And again, Having acid control, as you see in the box on the right, is important to, in, to resolving Barrett's esophagus. This is data published recently by Dr. Bell looking comparatively in a randomized control fashion in the Caliber trial, comparing it to twice daily PPI therapy showing excellent relief from regurgitation, an excellent improvement in the Gertie H. Correll score, and excellent satisfaction with the current condition. And uh, you can see PPIs actually perform relatively well compared to magnetic sphincter augmentation, although it is still superior in reducing normal reflux episodes, normalizing the Demeter score and pH scores. But how do we compare against the gold standard in laparoscopic fundification? Well, this is comparative evidence from uh, a multi-institutional study that we put together looking at GERD quality, GERD, GERD HQRL, showing excellent response both to magnetic swing augmentation and laparoscopicness and fundification at the 12-month mark. And when you look closely at what happened with a comparative group in terms of the ability to belch, the ability to vomit and gas bloat. Well, magnetic sphincter augmentation favors, is favored in this, in this particular set of symptoms compared to laparoscopic fundification. Uh, and one of the claims that Lynx had was, look, we're a little bit more physiologic. Similarly, dysphagia rates are actually very similar between magnetic sphincter augmentation and laparoscopic fundification in the post-series, particularly with moderate to severe dysphagia. So we're not that different, even though this is one of the things that's been highlighted as a, a side effect to, fun, to magnetic sphincter augmentation. Lastly, if you look carefully at, at the Demeester score and the pH time, percent time pH, uh, you can see that, yeah, we come close, normalizing uh, Nissen fundification uh, and Lynx getting us down to about the 14.72 mark. But when you compare Lynx to Nissen, there's still a statistical advantage in terms of 
Nissen being a much better reflux controller, dropping that Demeester score down to a very low level, but we coined this super physiologic because normally people do have some element of reflux in the normal, in the normal patients. If you look closer, we've dropped the number of reflux episodes with links. The postprandial reflux episodes drop, but bloating and belching again su superior compared to laparoscopic fundification. And so I take this as that this device is doing what it's supposed to. It's more physiologic. This is a recent meta-analysis showing very similar things that I've just showed you. That was published by Dr. Bonavina's group. And then Dr. Bonavina's group also looked at a comparison to toupee. This is the only one, 103 toupees versus 135 magnetic sphincter augmentation devices. There was no pH data in this study, but GERD quality of life was outstanding in both groups and very similar in a propensity-matched analysis. So I would tell you that at, at greater than five years since the approval of the device by the FDA, we've had pretty balanced outcomes. PPI utilization rate is generally low. Reflux control approach is Nissen and is probably better than P double dose PPI. Quality of life is comparable to pay. We have similar dysphagia rates. The erosion rate is 0.3. The reoperative intervention rate is low at less than 3%. So these, I think, are relatively balanced outcomes for magnetic sphincter augmentation. I would conclude by saying that single art outcomes are, are consistent with improving HKRL, liberation for PPIs, controlling GERD, complications are uncommon, explant occurs very uncommonly, erosion is rare, managed endoscopically by most things. Extension of the original indications is starting to accumulate data, but as yet these are only one in two studies. Comparative outcomes suggest MSA is a very good alternative to laparoscopic fundification. Thank you.